It is so great to be here today with all of you at Imagine. I'm Steve Kent, the Chief Product Officer at No Labs, and today we're going to talk about two big categories. The first is the incredible breakthroughs that we've made developing No Labs Sensor, and the second is a deep dive into the art of data collection itself, and how you can use some of the methods that we've learned over, gosh, I think Zach and Jan, it's been several years, several different companies. I counted the other day, we've actually done 40 different projects together. So we're going to distill some of those key learnings for you today. This is my obligatory public company slide. Enjoy. All right, let's get into it. So no labs. Uh, I actually brought the sensor itself with me here today. It's about the size of two credit cards stacked together, and it harnesses the power of radio frequency spectroscopy to measure molecules non-invasively. And this is an incredible breakthrough. I think that the impact that this will have on the world is very similar to the invention of LEDs. And if you were to think about LEDs and all of the applications they have in the world around us, and even in human health and all of the different ways we use them today, I think this is going to have the same type of impact. Uh, and our first impact area is going to be in blood glucose. So I showed you the sensor, but earlier today we made a big announcement, and we announced our Generation 1 unit. I have it with me here. Actually, one of my colleagues flew it in this morning. This is unit number five. And for those who say hardware is hard, it's definitely true, but perseverance and a lot of effort um, and very thoughtful design and planning uh, allowed us to create this system, which would be um, deployed not only around the world, but it allows us to scale data collection at every step along the way, allowing us to make the best products possible. So what is blood glucose? Blood glucose is your body's primary source of energy. And I think of it like any other vital sign. Just like your heart rate, your heart rate variability, your body temperature, blood glucose is used by your body to move throughout the day, to carry on most of its primary functions. And it also is adapting to what I take in from a nutrition perspective. So you'll see in this figure here, the green line represents normal glucose fluctuations throughout the day. Um, and I can't be the only person who's done this, but if you eat 10 donuts, uh, you will have a glucose spike that's represented here in red, subsequently followed by a crash as my body is struggling to accommodate with this huge volume of glucose and insulin then reacting in, the, in my body. So that is a very normal thing that happens in all of us for blood glucose regulation, but in people who suffer from diabetes, prediabetes, or metabolic health issues, uh, this is actually a very serious condition that needs to be monitored very closely. And I just want to pause right here. This is the number that gets me and every one of our team members, and I know a lot of you at Edge Impulse, up every day. Two billion people suffer from prediabetes, diabetes, and other metabolic health issues, and they really, truly need our help uh, to live a healthier life and just to live so much more effortlessly than what's required today, which we'll get into the details. Uh, and as a technology developer, this is the type of problem that's a dream to be able to work on. Uh, and we're so incredibly proud with the progress that we've made in our system to make an impact here. And it comes down to knowledge is power, truly, and the power of measurement. And uh, if you know anyone who has diabetes, you'll see them taking their blood glucose measurements throughout the day. It's quite arduous. So these people really need a great tool to solve the problem of basic physiological measurement to allow them to manage their condition. Uh, but today, there is no commercially available, FDA-cleared, non-invasive solution for this use case. But that doesn't mean that there aren't any solutions. In fact, there are two solutions here that have been around for a long time. On the left, you'll see a spot check device. This is um, also known as a, a BGM. You have to actually stick your finger, draw blood. Uh, you carry around this measurement tool with you at all times. And you can think of it like a spot check. You might get three or 10 measurements a day, actually having to draw your blood every time. So it's a life-saving device. People use it every day. It's very impactful. But as you can imagine, with all the needles and test strips, it's not only invasive, but there's a, a, a cost burden associated with all those disposable elements. And on the right, you'll see uh, con uh, continuous glucose monitors, which are um, growing greatly in popularity. And that's largely because of the form factor. So similar to the finger stick, you actually adhere a button to your arm. You have to uh, place a microfilament under the skin. And you get a continuous reading 24 hours a day. The issue is, is that it's still very expensive, and there are a lot of disposables, because they only last for about two weeks. So if you're living with a lifelong condition like diabetes, for example, if you're a type 1 diabetic, you will be using this device for your entire life. So it can be quite costly. 
And that's where no labs comes in. So our sensor is form factor agnostic. You'll see the Gen 1 device here. And this is very similar to what you would experience with a spot check system, where I can go on and take a measurement throughout the day at any point in time in my choosing. But because the system is form factor agnostic, we actually have ambitions to turn this into a wearable experience. I think everyone in this room can appreciate the value of continuous data and the insights that that can provide as far as improvements in life and patient care. And that is all grounded in our mission, which is to develop convenient, accessible, and affordable non-invasive medical diagnostic solutions. And of course, as mentioned, our first focus is in blood glucose. But this is a really hard problem to solve. Uh, I'm sure many of you are no stranger to this. Many companies have tried and failed. Our team actually counted the other day. 88 companies, it's actually a few more, 88 companies have tried and failed to solve this application area. And a lot of that has to do with the availability of existing sensor technology. They're trying to use what's already out there in the world. Uh, and we know better than anyone this is, is that this is difficult because we actually started in optical-based sensing. Years ago, we started with LEDs, and we were able to actually see some maybe signal of glucose. We had some confidence, um, but we couldn't turn that into a commercially viable system. So when you think about scaling a product for two billion people, it has to all come together in a very easy to use product experience. So we had to innovate. Multiple years, over 200 different iterations of our technology have allowed us to get to what I showed you a few moments ago, which is our generation one device. And there are two primary components. On the top, there's an antenna array. Within the Gen 1 unit is an RF generator. And together, those two things work in concert to create what we call an energy field. You can think of it as a broadband RF energy sweep that basically measures anything that you put above the sensor, including human tissue. So why does a sensor work when other technologies haven't? A lot of this has to do with the band of the electromagnetic spectrum that we operate in. So we operate in uh, microwave and radio wave bands, and using this broadband sweep through the one device in the Gen 1, we're able to sweep through 400,000 different frequencies uh, in just a matter of seconds. So we're able to collect a much richer data set than has been historically available. And you'll also see on the left in the blue box, typical LEDs and health wearables actually live in that optical and vis uh, visible light spectrum. Um, and if you want to change any of the frequencies that you're measuring with those LEDs and those devices, you have to physically change the hardware. So it's very difficult to explore new things and adapt. But when you're using radio frequency, we can do all of that programmatically. So in the Generation 1 device, I, can, I like to think of it as the power of 400,000 LEDs in the space of about of a nickel. So it's a big breakthrough. Another major area that has allowed us to succeed where others have failed is we're able to see deeper into the human body. Microwaves and radio waves can actually see centimeters into human tissue, and we like to think of it as measuring the full cellular stack. And in comparison, again, to traditional optical-based sensors that you'll find in most health wearables today, though incredibly useful for certain things, they're quite limited as to what they can see through. If you have very thick skin, uh, if you have different um, uh, uh, darknesses of skin pigmentation, all of those things can limit the amount of light that goes into the sensing area. So those operate on the order of millimeters, where we have overcome that challenge and can now see centimeters into the body. So not only a much more flexible and rich data set, but more sampling locations than ever before. Uh, and to me, you know, working on this for so long now, to see this device in action in our lab every day just makes me so proud and, and very happy with our progress because this type of scaled data collection and what we've been talking about a lot today is what's going to allow us to take it to the next level with machine learning. Um, now, that was the basics and primer on no labs, but today I'd imagine this is about you guys. As I mentioned, we've done so many of these projects now. We've had a lot of incredible learnings. So I wanted to share our approach to data collection to build some of the best models possible for human health applications. And it really comes down to nailing the fundamentals. Uh, truly, and, and we're going to break down what is typically a very complex problem uh, or situation into a series of tangible chunks. So solving a problem like diabetes for 2 billion people, like I said, is quite complex, but you can break it into these discrete chunks. So for you, if it's a small or a large problem, these methods actually work for most types of development when you're doing data collection. 
So the first is, I hope you're working with some new sensor, some new system, some product that's going to help the world. The second is you need to think about a representative sample of the global population. Who is going to be using your device? The third is the testing conditions, understanding all of the areas that somebody could use this device in their daily life. The fourth is, I think, you know, multimodal sensing and using suites of sensors is so common uh, across devices today. I encourage you to do the same if you're developing a new system. There's a lot you can learn from breaking out signal from noise as you incorporate other sensors into your, into your package. Uh, and then the fifth and really important for clinical systems like ours, especially in medical device, is using um, industry gold standard references. Uh, for us, that will be you know, blood draws and things like that. And for you, it could be something else. Each application typically has its own gold standard reference. And when you're doing data collection, it's important to consider this because your gold standard reference in model accuracy is technically your theoretical maximum of performance. So very important to understand how you're doing. But over time, I would also encourage you to think about you could be developing the new gold standard yourself. So looking at batches of gold standards together, because there's usually a few, and seeing how you stack up is really important. And all of this is in the spirit, I think, really grounded again in point number two, which is thinking about being inclusive with your data collections and building equitable algorithms for all. So, this is our formula. We do this every single day. Uh, and truly for us, we believe that data collection is the foundation of algorithm development. We've done this many times. It keeps working. So I'm very excited to share what is actually quite a simple process. On the left, you'll see we collect raw sensor data from our novel system. The key word here, of course, being raw. You need raw data when you're doing these early data collections. We then collect that uh, in a time-aligned fashion to some glucose reference data. We then include a suite of other sensor data. And again, the really important word here is raw data. You want the highest resolution data sets possible for your data science teams to work with. And then we test in a number of different people, people who are healthy, people who have diabetes, um, all walks of life. And then next to that, we also include different environments and conditions. And this is really important because you, know, you can't just operate in the lab or in the R&D setting. You need to be able to operate your system in someone's day-to-day -day life. Um, now, all of this is supported by a, a very incredible strategic partnership and coordinated effort between our software development team and Edge Impulse. Thank you all for making our lives so much easier. Uh, and all of that fuels our data science initiatives, who are then able to very quickly and in an iterative fashion learn and develop using the best-in-class machine learning and AI techniques. And the goal output of all of this is a validated algorithm or suite of algorithms that is going to allow you to set a new benchmark for model performance in your use case. So that's how we do it every day. But how does this apply to you? Um, I think that you can actually use this as a frame of reference for any new area that you're looking to set a data collection in, or if you're going to build a new product, what you need to think about. Uh, and it's, it's all the same steps. You're going to have some novel data. You're going to have a gold standard reference from your specific application area. It can be more than one. Uh, and then you're going to have a suite of sensors. And I really want to encourage you to think about the suite of sensors and multimodal sensing again. And I put motion at the top here because I'll use an example in LEDs. We know in optical sensing, if you're measuring the human body, motion impacts your signal. So it's really important that you have something like an accelerometer on your device to help understand uh, whether or not you need to filter your optical data, or if you need to take some other action to further hone in on the signal itself. Lots of different use cases there. And then moving into an equitable algorithm. How are you designing your algorithm for all different types of people and really thinking about your demographics broadly? Are you building a global device? Are you building a national and regional device? Is it for a specific group of people with a specific condition? Um, but I really encourage you to spend a lot of time on this topic. Companies are starting to do a better job of this now. Um, but it need, more work is to be done, I think, broadly in the industry. And then real world use data. Again, thinking about your use cases. Uh, is it a 24-7 wearable, like a CGM or uh, a U-band for no labs? Is it a spot check device, like the Gen 1 or a finger stick? Uh, is somebody going to be using this on their commute to work? Are they going to be using it in an airplane? What are all the ways that someone's going to be interacting with your technology? And how do you figure out how your system's going to operate in those settings early on? Um, and again, ending with validated high quality algorithms and system uh, performance capabilities that hopefully set a new bar for your industry. So 
That's how you start to break down broad population questions. But an area that I really encourage companies to think about is also understanding the whole person. This is really important, and I think more and more companies now than ever are starting to do it as 24-7 wearables are becoming so common in our day-to-day -day life. So if I think about the basic elements of a human being, you, Jan, for example, we have your mind, then we have your body, and then we have your environment. Those are three categories that we can start to break down your interactions with and measure them in a way that you would sensors. There's also a critical element of time. You know, I am very different now than I was when I was born. I'm gonna be very different from myself 20 years from now, and frankly, I'm gonna look different to sensors after I eat lunch. So understanding time as a component in your data collections is another way to amplify the insights that you can generate in your studies. Um, I do want to emphasize something about the relationship between the mind and body and environment and just why this is so important. So the mind-body connection. Um, for example, if I'm in the jungle and I encounter a tiger, I'm going to be terrified, and my body is going to flood with adrenaline, and my fight or flight response is going to activate, and all of this free glucose is going to be released to give me the energy I need to flee the tiger and hopefully survive to flee the tiger another day. And that's great. That's exactly what you want to happen in that setting. The problem is, is that in modern society, when you think of things like chronic stress, instead of a tiger, it could be, I don't know, a triggering email. Somebody could be stuck in traffic and having road rage, for example, or you could have a very distressing phone call. The body doesn't know any different. You will still have that same fight or flight response, and your body will be flooded with glucose, but it doesn't have anywhere to go. So being able to understand these other components that are very real connections in your physiology, I think will allow us to make not only better algorithms for how we're measuring it specifically, but what guidance we can give to people and how they take action. And where to get started? So for us, I, we always start small. We try to start with the highest quality, most thought out data collections possible to really set our ceiling of our understanding and model accuracy. And I encourage you to do the same. It's time consuming. It does feel like, oh, should we go out into the world and test everything and get all of the data? And I really encourage you to actually think small because you're going to get better quality results and you're going to learn very quickly how you need to adapt your data collections to answer questions that you may not have foreseen. And then over time, you're going to continue building on your data size and your data set size and you're going to then be able to understand and optimize for real world performance. So start small. Think of it as your foundation and really build into it. And this has another benefit. So for those of you in the commercial or finance or leadership space, when your data collection and uh, data science team asks for a pretty significant budget to invest in this, listen. D high quality data collection becomes a digital asset. They're reusable. Uh, and over time, as I said, as you build these very large data collection, uh, data assets, you will actually have the industry leading information into your application area. So you're just going to know more than everyone else. Um, and you're also going to be able to create not only new models, but a new level of performance that will, your competitors may struggle to keep up with. Um, and I always like to highlight IP. A lot of your IP will come from this area as well. Uh, and for us at No Labs, our data collection method and philosophy has allowed us to uh, be the number one worldwide IP holder in our application area. So that's a big deal. That's globally. So build over time, it is a digital asset. And the approach. So what, what is the philosophy and how you go about doing this? How do you build a medical system that can be used by all? And for us, it's grounded in two core pillars. The first is transparency. Show your work. Publish where you can. This is incredibly important to establish trust and confidence with your customers who are, you know, at some point they may be uh, entrusting their medical decisions with you and your system. So it's very important to be transparent in your development. The second pillar is validation. There are known and rigorous methods to validate your model accuracy, your system performance. Hold yourself to the highest bar. It will only help you in the long run. Uh, and if anyone's looking for inspiration, we actually have an entire landing page on our website dedicated to research and validation. We publish all of our work there. So I highly encourage you to check it out. So we talked about all of the incredible work that we've done to create this novel sensor. We've talked about the methods that you can apply in your data collections to hopefully build the best products that your use cases have ever seen. And for us, in following these methods, we know that when we succeed, we will provide the first FDA-cleared non-invasive blood glucose monitor for those two billion people who so desperately need a better solution. Thank you.